Kamada. So from that, the result is here. So that okay, this is a, the result from canopy max model. In this case, the treetop, you know, the uh, omission and the commission error uh, are minimized simultaneously. And after the treetop identi identified, that only gives you the number of trees over a landscape. Uh, to get the crown site, you have to do an image segmentation to find the boundary of trees. So we're using uh, the watershed segmentation uh, approach. Uh, to, to separate that. So this is a, a visualization of the algorithm. Um, like you build a dam to separate two watershed, pretty much like you, 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 you uh, invert the kind of high model, like two watershed here, and then you uh, punch a hole through each treetop and put into the water, the water going up, then start to merge, and then you, the algorithm is like pretty much automatically build a dam to separate those. So it's sort of like automatic identify or delineate the tree crown. That's not the, the, uh, the end of the story though. Um, so this is uh, um, the result after using um, that algorithm, after working so hard to minimize the error for tree top detection. Uh, this is the result, there's three trees here. Only two trees are mapped. The reason is, you know, this two tree is kind of deciduous tree, oak, oak tree. Then that does not have a sharp top as the conifer. So from the lighter point, it does don't, don't, if you look at the point cloud in 3D software, it does not have a, a valley between two trees. If you don't have a valley, then it's hard to identify, find the tree top there. So I, I, I map the trees based on another, another fact. So the first fact, the tree top is the highest point. The second fact, the tree top is near the center of the tree crown. So uh, from this, I do a distance transform. A distance transform, after that, you get an image that the points close to the center has far distance from the edge. So you have artificially created some local maximum. From that, you separate the trees. So uh, I use basically using vertical information, horizontal information to find those trees. So this is the result I had uh, before, like mapping. Uh, this is a, a um, if you work on the edit covariance data, you know, in the U.S. that's FluxNet. This is a, a, a edit covariance of Flux Tower site in California. Um, I map all the trees in surrounding the tower. The tower is the center. So every tree is from that you have the tree height, you have the crown size, and I do some work to try to collect the leaf for individual trees and then map individual tree uh, leaf area. So slightly different color here showing the, the different amount of leaf area for each individual, uh, individual trees. So uh, after that, um, recently there's some uh, uh, some interesting work has been done to mapping along this line. Um, so some research from Europe tried to, my algorithm has one uh, disadvantage is because based on the canopy high model. So any tree like a block by the uh, big tree will be hard to find, okay? But with, they're using a, called a 3D normalized cord algorithm, be able to find some trees uh, below small tree, below the large tree. Um, but the problem is uh, there's lots of parameter getting involved. Um, they published the result for a very, very small area, like 10 by 20 meter, uh, meter plot. Uh, so, so I'm not going to mention all those details. So um, in terms of like individual tree mapping, um, You know, it's very exciting uh, for the forestry people, be able to, even for the uh, ecologist. If you be able to map a tree for a landscape, that will save a lot of time and cost, okay? You know, in the U, uh, USDA Forest Service, for the experimental forest, they spend uh, like millions of dollars per year to survey the trees, measure tree height. And even in the ground, you don't see the tree top, so they get a tree, tree height by estimation, by Regression model, you take a sample of tree, measure DBH, measure height, open open ground, establish regression model, and apply that regression model to, to all the trees, if you have DBH, because the model is based on DBH. 
So this is very kind of uh, um, exciting for those uh, uh, guys. Um, but the, the problem of this, even right now, you know, this for I have tested in those algorithms like in California, Sierra Nevada. It's pretty good performance. Um, but for tropic forests like Hawaii, it's hot because multi-layer canopy, small trees above, you know, below the larger trees. Uh, that's pretty difficult. In that case, pretty much, you have to rely on the area-based, the simple approach. Uh, but in many, many cases, like Southeast Asia plantation, you know, this is the perfect approach. Palm trees, rubber tree, you know, you can fly and count, collect data and map all the trees easily. And I still did some work in Hawaii and then in Big Island in the Palina habitat. So I work with um, Greg Esner from um, Stanford University, and he has a system that collects hyperspectral data and airborne light simultaneously. So this is the hyperspectral data he has. Um, so this is a false color. So the red color represents uh, indiv individual trees, uh, the trees there, not the individual yet. Uh, so this is the digital surface model I generated from the LiDAR data it carries. And then this is the result. Like our first separate individual trees, map all individual trees. And then from within each tree segment, I get in the hyperspectral data and do an object-based classification. That's another trend, trendy topic in remote sensing. So from this, I have a complete survey that's of what the tree is in here, what the species is. Now, luckily here, there's only three, two tree species, the nail tree and the mamani. So um, I have some students here working on this other uh, topic, how to use this data for uh, predict, like, asking, like understanding the population of the palina bird. It's one of the uh, endangered bird species in, in Hawaii. Um, I used my software uh, algorithm in California recently. Uh, in 2001 or 2002, uh, the, light, the, the Lake Tahoe Basin was, uh, was flown. Uh, for an area of a total of like 1,151 uh, kilometer. So I using the software algorithm to run the whole landscape. Um, and then I map up here, there's a ten, uh, uh, over 20 million trees. So that project was try to, um, to, ask, to assess the fire risk, like uh, how possibly the tree, uh, no, um, the, uh, a place where we are have a, a fire, white fire. So and for that case, you need to es uh, estimate the lo we call the canopy uh, base height, crown base height, like how high is the lowest branch is from the ground, because that's distance determining how likely you will catch a fire from the ground. Um, there's some other uh, interesting work I'm doing as well using this data set. But uh, this is unprecedented uh, because never peop people never work on the individual tree level. And of course, if you're using just generated like tree, tree high raster, um, uh, that's very easy. You, uh, this is some example data set, a process for, uh, um, for Vermont. So I download the data, LIDA data, and the process generate. This is the DS model. And this is the DEM model. So you get a, a divide the data into individual tiles, be able to manage it. Uh, to be uh, able to manage the, 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 the big data set. Usually it's like hundreds of gigabytes or a, a few terabytes. And then this is a high model. So you, you can map the tree height in the resolution like one meter for the whole state easily using this. So that's pretty much the, 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 uh, the vegetation mapping technology. So there's two streams. Individual tree based, area based. Individual base will be more challenging, more useful, but it is not so, sometimes not so pre uh, precise. Still a long, long way to go, be able to improve the trees. So, what does this mean to eco hydrology? Okay, uh, I'm not an eco hydrologist at all, uh, but I recently worked with uh, Tom Jabaluka in our department, finish. Uh, a project of mapping the ET for the state of Hawaii. Um, so, as, a, as many of you know, ET is uh, probably one of the most important the component of hydrological cycling. 
because it determines the fate of rainfall and determine how much run runoff is left and how much groundwater may be able to uh, charge. So uh, these are God's figure, nice figure from Wikipedia uh, this morning. And the most popular fun uh, equation to estimate ET, of course, it is the Palmer Matisse equation. The Palmer Matisse uh, equation is, you know, here, there's uh, like S, gamma, like, uh, gamma and uh, this is the air density, a specific heat, these are all constant. Um, there's a three major input. A is available energy. Okay. And two other important parameters, RA and RC. RA is the aer aerodynamic resistance. Uh, RC is the canopy resistance for water transport. This is the most diff two most uh, uh, difficult parameters to, to get, usually. Uh, besides, A is also difficult, of course. Uh, we work hard on that, getting that. But LIDAR can make a big contrib contribution to, to solve, to estimate these two parameters, the so aerodynamic and the uh, uh, canopy um, uh, uh, resistance. How? You know, this is the equation I grabbed from the, 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 the report. So. Uh, usually, the aerodynamic resistance is based on here, k is a constant, u is a, uh, is a wind speed, so you need the wind speed. So the aerodynamic resistance is based on the, essentially is a estimate based on the wind speed with input of vegetation data. So what inf inf vegetation data you need? Here there's a t two other parameters, d and z. d is the zero plane displacement, and uh, uh, Z is the roughness length. For those of you know like um, biometrology or know the ET, you know this is is like profile wind speed above the canopy is high wind speed, and when you get into the canopy, it slow down to zero. So D D zero is almost like a zero. Actually, you have to shift a little bit, add a roughness length to really get the zero wind speed. So that we kind of determine like how fast you move. The, uh, uh, the the water away, right? So it's a, from the meteorological uh, perspective. So to get these two, you need to get the, the RA. You need a, need a this and this. So zero plane displacement, and there's many different. By the way, if you have done re research in this area, you know there's many different way, different equation to estimate these two parameters. So I grabbed the equation from this report. So here we use the equation that the zero plane displacement is based on height, is a function of height, and also leaf area index. That makes sense, right? The high, the taller the tree, you have to shift the, the zero plane displacement higher. So of course, it's the most important parameter. Of course, the canopy density, which here is also affected, so using leaf area index. Okay. So this can be the direction from LIDAR. Leaf air index actually also can be directed from LIDAR. Okay, so we we can use LIDAR to get this roughness. Roughness length again is another function of H and AR. So basically, from LIDAR, LIDAR we can get these two parameters. So get the zero plane displacement roughness length. From that we can derive aerodynamic resistance. And uh, in this report we. Uh, we're using an approach that divide the ET to three components, which is the wet canopy evaporation, and second is the transpiration, which is like the move of water from out of the stomata, right? And also the soil respiration. So this is the equation here. Um, like here, the first wet canopy evaporation is very important to know the vegetation cover plus fraction. How, how much ground is covered by vegetation? That's a direct measure of LIDAR. We can simply like taking like what's the number of uh, uh, canopy points compared to the all points. That's a better characterized than uh, you know if we use the NDVR or some what are other remote data to get it can be covered. LIDAR definitely will give you a better estimate of that. For the transpiration, you know there's again using aerodynamic uh, canopy. Um, a resistance, kind of resistance that can be solved before, right? And FC again, 
with uh, uh, also can be estimated from uh, like FW is the water uh, canopy uh, wet, uh, wetness that need the field data though. Soil respiration and here I pull out like try to organize this uh, information that you can easily flow. So one of the new parameter here is called RU. RU is a function of US. US is a function of like UC and AA. UC is kind of, uh, I forget what it may be, a constant. But here is A is another new, besides H, A is important. So what is A? A is a function of H and AA again. So if you're using like this kind of approach to get an ET, you can get a, the key parameters from, from uh, a LiDAR as well. So that's one approach, and I tried to search before preparing this talk. I tried to search like LIDAR and ecohydrology in Web of Science. Uh, I only find one paper, or, or at most like two papers. The other paper is is a very using very simple approach. So this is the only approach, uh, only paper I have found through the Web of Science that really seriously using kind of process based um, ET model um, and to. Uh, take advantage of LIDAR information. So this paper was published in 2012 in Ecohydrology, and they using the approach like uh, the Jim Baluka report. Uh, is a, a, they're different uh, symbols though, but it's pretty much the same. Here is the uh, transpiration, E-SAP. SAP is, means SAP flow, okay? Um, builds the transpiration, transport from the, through the stain, right? Uh, uh, so the step flow determine pretty much the transpiration, and EI is wet can canopy uh, um, uh, evaporation. But here they're using a little bit different approach called a gash gash model, okay? And for the uh, soil evaporation, they're using E flow, and that actually here E flow there's it, they that need a, a, a energy available energy on the floor. The the, the energy. Uh, on the floor is determined by leaf area index above it. So that is a function of AI. So if you have AI, then you can, uh, that's important for, for improve the, the soil EPO evaporation. And for the gas model to calculate um, the wet canopy evaporation, and the LIDAR also can help to get the canopy cover. That's the most precise way to get a canopy cover in, among all remote sensing technology. And for the subflow, that's the big difference between um, the previous approach and here. They're using, they estimate the <coughs> transpiration by first estimate the sap wood area or a, uh, a landscape. So of course LIDAR cannot see the sap wood area directly, but sap wood is a function of dBH. The fu dBH is a function of height. Height can be measured by LIDAR. Okay, so they simply create a model that based on LIDAR, height metrics, and then do some field measurement on the ground, area-based approach. They do some core measurements, measure the the uh, uh, the sapwood. So they create a statistic model and the map that and scale up to the whole landscape. One thing I have to mention that is that they, they did mention uh, some places to improve this model is because. The model only based on the, and I assume is based on the, the sapwood area is related to the DBH only, but actually sapwood is not only based on the DBH, also affected by stain density. Dense canopy, or the dense uh, stand, or, or stand, forest stand with a few trees, even though the total bow base area are the same, the sapwood area is different. So they measure some improvement. So that, kind of linked to my previous work, like if we can map all the trees, then we can get it standard density directly. So that I can improve the sap wood area uh, estimation. So, uh, so that's the, the two examples, you know, uh, I can think of. One is the funding from the literature, the other is through my project. So there's not much research has been done using LIDAR for ecohydrology yet. Um, so there's definitely a, a room for, for research, uh, but one thing I think you probably ask, like, how to get this data? Is this data free, easy? Uh, like, uh, yeah. 
uh, easy to, to assess. Uh, in the US, the USGS has used to have a, a website called the CLIC, Center of Light and Knowledge, blah, blah, some other name. So that thing has been discontinued. They moved the data to the US uh, GS Earth Explorer website, but it's, it's a little bit more, too, more difficult to, to search data. Uh, so this is the data coverage in about maybe 2005, uh, finally from the internet. That's, well, that's one impression. At that time, just, uh, the, red, the green area is the places you have free LiDAR data available about 10 years ago. Okay? This is the coverage of LiDAR data you have now. You have LiDAR data for almost like the whole uh, eastern U.S. This is like one meter or even higher resolution. Okay? Uh, but of course, the problem is how to process, you know, uh, that's something I can contribute as well. So, uh, so this data is available. So if you, you know, LiDAR data is not a, not a, it's like a small scale application. It's now due to the um, advances of uh, the uh, advances in, in algorithm, uh, the data collection, the reduced uh, data cost. So you can apply LiDAR for large scale. It's possible. So the take home message for my talk is first, I hope I have making a, uh, uh, a good summary of like LiDAR is really changing the way of, of mapping vegetation. Uh, make a significant advance mapping vegetation, but of, of course, uh, terrain. And the second, uh, unfortunately, there's not much research had to be, be done of to using LIDAR for eco hydrology yet. So look at the paper. You know, the AGU has a session in last year, like eco hydrology and LIDAR. But I searched, I didn't go, but I, there's no, nobody submitted yet because the, <laughs> no, nobody has done research for much research yet along this line. But definitely you see the potential because the LIDAR can directly provide most information like height, leaf area index, and many things they can fit into the model. If you're using process model, then you can generate a very precise estimation of ET, which is probably the most, component, most important component of hydrological uh, cycle. And hopefully, so everybody re realize uh, uh, this is a gold mine for research, and I hope if you have any question, question feel free to talk to me. So, thank you. Questions? Peter? Which of the Hawaiian islands have complete lighter coverage, if any? Uh, no. So last year, in, 2000, uh, so in 2013, in Oahu, NOVA and a few other uh, USDA had uh, joined the uh, uh, campaign to try to like, collect data for the island, island of Wahoo, but they stayed here for maybe one or two months, I don't know how long exactly, and they, uh, they didn't finish the job because there's uh, too much cloud cover. They never get to find a clear day to collect data for the mountains area. So they, still, they have some data, but uh, pretty much cover the coastal area. So, to my knowledge, there's no complete LIDAR coverage for the state of Hawaii. Uh, uh, Greg actually has some data in, I know, Big Island, and uh, uh, Kauai, and maybe in Oahu, but I know that he has some, he has his own Kennedy album observatory uh, system to collect data for many places in Hawaii, but uh, I don't think that's a complete coverage. For Big Island, uh, in the southern part, uh, the experimental forest, and they have pretty big coverage. Yeah. Yes. How big is a lidar unit? Could it be thrown? Just give a presentation. So this right now, um, for this air bomb uh, system that uh, most commercial companies are using. They are the size of maybe half of this, uh, yeah, podium, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, so, but, but there are some, uh, um, 
it's like amateur <laughs> grade uh, uh, light instrument. I know that uh, even in the KCC, some student was trying to using lidar to measure, put in a robot, try to kind of do navigation. In that case, you know, that depends on what you're using. If you really want to map terrain uh, for with high density, and then pretty much you, you need a span like they they sell for one million or one point five million. That's the regular price. But uh, so sounds like a big, but one project can easily cost like a few hundred k. So once you get a project contract, you can easily uh, uh, pay off your investment. Yes. So on the website where you can download the lidar data for the like the, for the main one, uh, does that usually come as your raw data? Raw data, raw data. I'm talking about raw data right now. Yeah. Okay. So. And so they. So that's very important because you that's you need raw data to get a height if you. I work on vegetation. The DEM is uh, only for hydrological analysis. Do no. they, they provide, does anybody provide those as well, like just the DEM? They provide the raw data in a binary format, usually it's AIS. So there's a few, so USGS, uh, and also in UC San Diego, San Diego maybe, they have the open topography. So they have collected the, the NC uh, airborne uh, laser mapping, National Center of uh, Airborne Laser Mapping, and they have flown, funded by NSF to collect data uh, for different places, they put those data there as well. So, but that web I'm showing is kind of maybe integrate all different sources. So you have, so now it's almost like cover half of the nation. Um, and for California, you know, the, the western coast, like Oregon and Washington, they have big, big car good coverage as well. So for those people like working in carbon, climate change, um, e ecosystem science there, this is um, a, a treasure, that's why I could put it there. <laughs> uh, so yeah. the way it to be used, the main issue is still data processing though. Yes. Um, thank you for your talk. So I'm so beginner about LIDAR. So what is the uh, size of this image? What is what? Size to special resolution of the What is the? Area of each image of LIDAR. OK. What is the swath? Like is, you talk about the swath? Uh, yeah. A swath depends on flying height and the field of view, right? So. Um, so usually, if uh, the field of view angle now that maybe it's like 50 degree, and then you get a height, you can you can easily calculate typical flying height from 500 to maybe 2,000 meter above ground from airplane. So that really vary. But uh, uh, when you have a contract, you the data usually has been you know sometimes you have to fly an area uh, with some overlap, um, then each. Each swath is maybe they, they will not deliver the data to you like uh, the uh, a landsat or, or modis like individual image. They are, they reorganize those to to individual tile. So the tile can be any size. They can they sometimes they, they organize data into the USGS topo Kojako, uh that size to you, and uh, I usually. With my own program, I organize data to one square kilometer, two square kilometer. So that can be handled by even 32-bit system with a moderate memory. So the tempo frequency also depends. To what? The tempo frequency of the image. It's just when I mean flight, I think. Tempo frequency. Temporal frequency, okay. Temporal frequency, of course, is like how how much you can pay to okay. ask them to to fly. It's not a free, not a like satellite. They they fly over you and collect data. It's very costly. Uh, I always mention that 2003 made a contract or spent paying the ten thousand dollar for one square mile. So nowadays, 
So I get a data set of like nine points, average nine points per square meter at that time. Nowadays, for that kind of data set, you maybe spend for a big project maybe like four hundred dollar per square mile. Yeah, so significantly reduce. But the, okay. Would you say it's still common to have efforts being directed towards covering places once, as opposed to going back and covering the same area multiple? Depend on what you're interested in. Topography? No, you know, except in like you are studying the earthquake, like something. For the, NCOM, yeah. for example, you mentioned the National Center for Airborne Laser Mapping. They were focusing on getting the, air, the whole, as much of the country covered as they could, and they'd accept proposals from people, and some of the proposals wanted to cover an area, say, in the spring and then the fall, look at how the trees were different than those kinds of proposals would sort of hard to get through. Uh, I don't know how much it's changing with other uh, institutions. Yeah, I, I don't know. You know, for vegetation, we in, in my study site, we did get a LIDAR data set. That was 2003 and uh, about seven years later. But the forest, we are analyzing the data, it's, you don't see much difference. So some forests, you know, the tree mortality, pretty much, this is nature's Spotic uh, 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 event, and if you have like like a hurricane, like in the Louisiana, then in that case you can easily detect her to change. So for deforestation, like in Amazon, you can use the lidar. You know, there's definitely a lot of value. Be able to like do multiple surveys. Depend on how quick this event happened. Depend on how if you work, work on vegetation, how how fast the tree grow. So for the oak tree, they are pretty much like standing maybe above, but not like going very, growing very hard, high. So uh, it depends. Yes. So can we use the, you define lighter as using the distance between the emitting thing and the object? You say use a different lighter? You use you define the lighter as. Something in which you impinge the signal and the signal travels back and you measure the distance. But can you use LiDAR for getting the properties of the object you are hitting on? So for example, what property? Water or is it a water body or not a water body? Water body will be easy because usually you don't have return from the water body. So there's a hole there. Uh, okay, so yeah, so if you imagine like the, the si size of the lake, you flow LiDAR, then maybe only have the um, and in that case, I will recommend our imagery. You know, the, even for for the this kind of uh, so they're using an infrared laser, usually 1,064 nanometer that can penetrate a little bit through the shallow water. So you can still get some return, even there's the same from water. So other, if the water is deep to a certain uh, amount, depending on the turbidity though, uh, then you will not get a return. I was referring to things like water bodies, grasslands, street cover, I mean, is it asphalt road or grassland and things like that. So, so you want to differentiate grassland versus tree? Yeah, I mean, characterize the ground surface, so that would lead to other hydrological studies. Yeah, that's possible. So... I was at a meeting a couple, a few, a few years ago, and they were able to, uh, they were making, some people the meeting were making a claim that they could detect a great amount of soil moisture. And I don't know if they were looking at the full waveform to yeah. get at that. Yeah. And, and I followed it. The, what I was told is you could, and in some cases you could use the return signal to get the color of the surface. So if you need the color of the moisture kind of thing, that's a yeah, step yeah. towards what you're asking about. So, so I read some stuff, I think it's way to think, I don't think you can do it, don't think you can do it with discrete. Well, for maybe, yeah, this, you know, you have to maybe in the soil moisture, pretty much probably you need uh, using the intensity. But for LIDAR, people usually using the XYZ, which is the geometric information. Mm -hmm. um, that's yeah. what my question was. I mean, you yeah. define everything in terms of XYZ, so none was related to properties of the uh, material that was But the certain thing, like uh, tree versus grass, you still be able to differentiate from the, the uh, high, uh, high distribution. So it's the, so basically for vegetation, there's two components, right? One is the, the structure, like how high, how wide, like the distribution, 3D architecture of the tree. 
and the second is the, the physiognomy, is the refractance. Uh, so LiDAR has only one band, usually, one laser, except you, you know, now there's another, there's uh, uh, some UK scientists proposing like two laser. One is red, another is infrared, so you can get it here. And DVI, not, uh, you can get a vertical profile of NDVI. That's pretty cool. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. Okay, yeah, thanks to the speaker. Thank you very much.